Good morning, church. I hope you're not getting worn out in this series on the problem of suffering and evil in the world. I know it's a difficult slog through some complex issues. But it's an exceedingly important question, and there's really no way around the problem. It's best to make sure that we can give an adequate answer to those who have honest questions about how we can believe in a good God in the face of so much pain. So let's review the parts of the answer that we've already discovered. We want to see how they build upon one another to make a coherent framework for understanding God and the world in which we live and all of its pain, all of its suffering. So first, the foundation. By his own sovereign plan, God created a real world, not a fantasy world, in which cause and effect occur as one of the constants throughout the universe. And this universe that he made includes sentient, self-aware beings, that's humans and angels, who possess genuine freedom, which is the ability to choose whether to act in accordance with God's will or to act contrary to God's will. And from these two fundamental truths about the creation, plus the biblical accounts of the history of humanity and the angelic realm, we derived the following four pieces of our answer to start with. Number one, the creation of a real world allowed for the possibility of pain as a necessary aspect of reality, and so some pain and suffering, therefore, is due simply to the fact that the world is real. Secondly, all humans have sinned, bringing corruption, pain, and suffering into the the world as a result, so some pain and suffering is due to the choices of sinful people and the subsequent corruption of human societies. Number three, Satan leads a group of angels that rebelled against God. They formed a kingdom of darkness. It's engaged in a war against God. So some pain and suffering is due to the activity and influence of Satan and his demons, and they seek to destroy all that God made and all that he loves. Fourth, then, instead of determining everything that occurred in the universe, God determined to create a world in which there would be creatures with the capacity to make freely chosen self-determined decisions. And he would allow those decisions to stand. The choices of those beings impact what occurs in the world. As a result, not everything that happens is due to the exertion of the will of God. Much of the pain and suffering in the world, therefore, does not reflect God's will. And last week, we looked at the next piece of the answer. The Bible teaches us that God expressly takes responsibility for some of the pain and the suffering in the world in the form of judgment that he brings upon people. And he also allows pain and suffering as a consequence of his choice to make the kind of a world in which there's a measure of indeterminacy and freedom. But God uses that pain and uses that suffering to test us, to discipline us, to teach us, and to bring about greater good for individuals and families and nations and and the entire human race. All pain and suffering, even that that comes from evil, therefore, can be an opportunity to learn and to grow and to experience good from the hand of God. So, understanding that suffering can be used by God for testing and that His disciplining of people is, is real, that implies that God has ultimate ends in mind, ultimate ends that are designed for our benefit. His discipline, His instruction are used in the pursuit of our betterment and with the consummation of His plan for us and for the creation in mind. But that presents us with another problem. Because the universal experience of humanity is that death comes to all. No one escapes. And even when death is expected, or when death comes as a welcome relief after excruciating pain, it still represents the apparent victory of evil over good. I mean, think about it. A life that is filled with various degrees and kinds of pain and suffering ends with pain and suffering. All of the lessons that might be learned through God's discipline are therefore of relatively limited benefit if death is the end. If we all die in the end, of what use was all of the instruction? If the pain and suffering were intended to make us better, to teach us, but we die at the end anyone, what was the point of it all? The author of Ecclesiastes feels the weight of this problem very deeply, and he concludes, all is vanity. 
It's all vanity. Why? Because death comes to everyone without regard for whether or not I've learned the lessons that God intended for me to learn. And modern thinkers have come to the same conclusion. Suffering and death call into question not only God's power, but His wisdom. Because if death is the end, of what ultimate benefit are His disciplinary actions? They're they're intended to improve our character and our life. But if we die, and that's the end, at best, those disciplines would seem to be a way of maybe avoiding certain other more debilitating kinds of pain in this life, addictions or dysfunctional relationships or mental anxieties or so forth. I have a better life. I suppose that would allow us to enjoy a better life. That would be a good thing. But how can that sort of benefit, temporarily as it is, be considered ultimate? If death is the end, why should you choose wisdom over folly? Why choose self-restraint over self-indulgence? Why choose the pursuit of holiness over the pursuit of pleasure? What possible reason could there be that would be adequate to deny myself some short-lived pleasures if everything's temporary and pain is the end? That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. If Christ is not raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we're going to die. Why not? And furthermore, there are some aspects of suffering in life and in the human experience that don't appear to have any disciplinary purpose other than possibly a punitive purpose. Or if there is a disciplinary or instructional purpose, the end that is gained is so completely disproportionate to the amount of suffering as to virtually or completely nullify whatever purpose might have been in mind. Think, for instance, of the genocidal efforts of 20th century despots like Adolf Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or Idi Amin. What kind of instruction, what kind of lesson warrants suffering on such a scale? Or think of some other examples that aren't quite as grandiose maybe, but sadly are not rare, the torture of prisoners. Random murders, children with terminal cancers, children who are abused, dementia in an elderly person, wars. If God has ultimate beneficial ends in mind for his people, it sure looks like much of their suffering does not lead to any of those beneficial ends unless death is not the end. What if death is not the end? You see, the Bible consistently testifies of a world beyond this world, a future age that both follows and replaces this present world, this present age. And the reality of that next age is fundamental to the biblical story. It's fundamental to the gospel. So that leads to several other implications for us as we think about the question of suffering and evil. First of all, the the present world is neither ultimate nor final. It's only preparatory for a more permanent world. As we heard from Paul's letter to the Corinthians this morning, death itself is not the end. Death will be overcome through entrance into God's heavenly kingdom. In comparison to the next world, the present world, including its pain, is it's ephemeral, it's, it's a vapor. Our pain might be intense, it's very real, but it's neither final nor lasting. The point or purpose of life in this world is not going to be found in this present life or in this present world, but in the next one. Likewise, God's purposes in using suffering to improve us are aimed not at helping us enjoy a better life in this world, but in preparing us for the next, for eternity. So, The use of suffering for testing points us to the difference between innocence and virtue. Adam and Eve enjoyed the innocence of the absence of sin in their original state. And prior to the encounter with the serpent, they were both innocent. They had not committed any evil. But they were not yet virtuous, since they had not yet overcome temptation. 
evil. The development of virtue requires testing. Because virtue is a positive quality. It's not simply the absence of a negative quality. You might say, I'm innocent. I've, I've never robbed a bank. Fair enough. Well, you're innocent of that crime. But to be virtuous, you must have refused opportunities to commit a theft and, in fact, performed acts of benevolence in its place. For this reason, Christian teachers throughout the history of the church have characterized God's purpose in the present age as soul-making. We see this as early as the second century. Wonderful uh, author, one of the church fathers named Irenaeus, who lived from about the year 130 to about 202, he spoke of redemption in an interesting word, divinization, the process by which God uses this world and its sufferings to increasingly bring us into conformity to God's image, even though we never actually become divine. So the creation of a future age toward which the present age is directed, that's not merely the result of a course correction to deal with the problems that came to us because of Adam's sin. It would appear rather that it was always God's intention that this present age would be a place for people to grow and to learn and to prepare for life in the world to come by developing virtuous character in this life. So when we realize that God's purposes for us are not limited to this present life, they extend into eternity, well then it isn't hard to understand pain and suffering in a completely different light, which drastically changes our perspective on things. If you look at the slide, for instance, this famous picture. In the image of the slide, do you see an old woman or a young lady? And if you're told that both of them are present, does that change the way you look at it? Can you see both? See, God's disciplinary measures are not limited to bringing us benefit in the present world. They are intended to secure benefit for us that outlasts this present world. So some of the suffering of this life is meant to produce traits and qualities in us that help fit us for life in the world to come. And since death is not the end, and this life is not the ultimate point of existence, there are some other considerations when we think about the relationship of pain and suffering to, uh, in this life to life in the next age. For instance, what about that suffering that appears purposeless? What about those types of suffering that are completely out of proportion any possible lesson that could come from it. Well, the Apostle Paul reminds us that suffering in this present age is not only preparing us for the next one, it is also going to result in reward in the next life. In Romans 8.18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And then in 2 Corinthians 4.17, He says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You see, even if there's absolutely nothing in the suffering that's designed to bring us good in the sense of making us better, of improving us in some way, God's still going to bring us good in the form of glory, an expression of the goodness of God that radiates through us forever. The Bible also promises that those who are followers of Christ, that all of the suffering of this life will be remedied in the next life. As we heard in the reading from the book of Revelation, the pain and the sufferings of this life will be erased, they'll be wiped away, they'll be replaced with a joy that overwhelms and banishes all sorrow. Famous words from a poem by Thomas More, a poem entitled, Come Ye Disconsolate. I think they're worth memorizing. It says, He says, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. No matter how bad you've got it right now, or ever will have, or ever have had, no sorrow, earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. So life, therefore, cannot be measured accurately simply in terms of this present world. The present world is inadequate to right all wrongs, to repay all debts, to reward all acts of faithfulness or obedience. And even God's judgment that is expressed in this life, it only partially repays those 
who act wickedly in harming others. God is eternal. Therefore, his love and justice are also eternal. And his justice requires that he fully repay those who do wrong and those who do right. And that means in order to be faithful to himself, God must have provided for a way to express his judgment with eternal effects. Which leads us to one of the most important conclusions in this journey that we're taking. One of the most important things to remember from this series. Good and evil can only be rightly assessed in the light of eternity. What you call good and what you think of as evil can only be rightly assessed in the light of eternity. And pain and suffering can only be properly measured or understood from the perspective of eternity. If this life is not ultimate, then the only way to measure pain and suffering in this world is to do so from the perspective of eternity. And so long as we look only at the problem of suffering and evil from the perspective of the temporary fleeting time of our short lives, with our limited knowledge and our limited wisdom, we will always, we will always have an inaccurate perception of our suffering. It's like trying to gauge the distance to an object on the horizon by looking through binoculars that you flipped around backwards. If I only measure my pain by what it costs me now or what it prevents me from doing or by whether or not it's deserved or fair, I will always be mistaken in my understanding and perception of it. And I will always wrongly assume either that God is at fault or he doesn't exist because I'm looking at the problem through the wrong lenses. And that brings us then to the consideration of the Christian teaching about heaven and hell in relation to the problem of suffering. There's, those are both huge categories and topics. I can't go through it all today. But and in both cases, I'm using the terms heaven and hell as shorthand. They're kind of code expressions for what the Bible refers to when it speaks of the world to come, the next age. Heaven refers to the place of God's presence. It's described in the passage that we read from Revelation as the new heaven and the new earth. In the age to come, God's presence, or heaven, will come to the restored or the recreated earth, and there's no more separation between the two. And those who belong to Christ, whose names are written in the book of life, will be there with him. Hell refers to the place created for the punishment of the devil and his angels, apart from the presence of God, Described as a place of torment, in Revelation it's known as the lake of fire, or the second death. Now those descriptions in Revelation are symbolic, but that does not mean that they are not real. They're not just ideas. Those images are designed to communicate truths that are impossible for us to visualize or to portray. But what they picture in imagery and descriptive terminology are eternal realities that are going to unfold when Jesus returns. Now, some accuse Christians of simply appealing to this imaginary future heaven as a way to avoid dealing with the reality of suffering here. You're just putting it off. But heaven is not an empty promise that we make to ourselves to fool ourselves so we can ease the pain of this life. It's the sure promise of a God who cannot lie. It's a promise given to us so that we may know that the pain of this life will be overcome by something that is more real, more substantive, more lasting than what we currently know and currently experience. And on the other end, there are those who think of heaven as sort of an automatic compensation for everyone who's had a rough life, in any degree that they think it's rough. But heaven is neither of those things. It is not compensation for suffering, and it is not automatic. Heaven is not the only stop on the afterlife bus. Or as one movie title put it quite erroneously, all dogs do not go to heaven. That is not what the Christian faith affirms. Heaven is the reward for those who belong to Christ, for whom the sufferings of this life have prepared them for the next life in his presence. And the promise of heaven is an essential element of Christian faith. It's inseparable from the fundamental truth of the gospel. It is therefore an inescapable part of the Christian answer to the problem of evil, evil and suffering. C.S. Lewis put this very well in his book, The Problem of Pain. He 
I quote, he says, we are very shy nowadays of even mentioning heaven. We are afraid of the jeer about pie in the sky and of being told that we are trying to escape from the duty of making a happy world here and now into dreams of a happy world elsewhere. But either there is pie in the sky or there is not. If there is not, then Christianity is false, for this doctrine is woven into its whole fabric. And if there is, then this truth, like any other, must be faced whether it is useful at political meetings or no. So let me make a short list of some of the key biblical teachings about heaven as it relates to pain and suffering that are woven into the fabric of Christian faith. And all of these have scriptural references. I'm not going to take time to go through that. If you're interested in that, you can always uh, download the notes of the sermon from our webpage. That's true any week, by the way. Uh, you can find all the references there. Number one, the hope of the resurrection is tied to the reality of Christ's resurrection, and it's also tied to the final conquest of sin in our lives. In heaven, in the presence of God, we will be transformed so that sin is eradicated, eliminating one of the causes of pain and suffering. Secondly, the new world is going to be characterized by righteousness, unlike the present world, because God's kingdom will be perfectly manifested and evil vanquished. Third, Jesus repeatedly promises everlasting rewards in the coming kingdom of God for those who follow him. And the apostles and the other New Testament authors similarly hold out the promise of rewards for faithful followers of Christ. It's throughout the New Testament. Fourth, the central Christian rite of communion, what we celebrate in our church every week, and churches around the globe do differently, but that rite celebrates not just the death and resurrection of Christ. It anticipates the fulfillment of his promise to return, to establish his kingdom, and to reward his followers. And fifth, Jesus and the New Testament authors all insist that it is impossible to rightly measure suffering and pain by reference to this life only. Those who attempt to live for pleasure or the accumulation of wealth, who seek comfort and security, fundamentally fail to comprehend that this life and its pleasures and its pain are temporary. Those of the next life are eternal. And so consequently, we are urged to live for that which is eternal rather than that which is temporary so that we'll have the right perspective on what is valuable and what is good and what matters as we go through this life. And when it comes to hell, most skeptics or critics of Christian faith would not consider the doctrine of hell as a part of the solution to the problem of suffering and evil. They see it more as an ev more evidence of the problem. But the critics argue that the idea of everlasting punishment or final judgment, rather than the unconditional forgiveness of everyone, what's known as universalism, they say that contradicts the notion of a loving and a benevolent God. But in fact, point of fact, the skeptic's notion of a loving and benevolent God is flawed. They don't see him rightly. Because it fails, their idea of love and benevolence fails to adequately address the issues of divine justice and righteousness. What is to be done, for instance, to those who have purposefully injured others and who have no remorse? How does forgiving them undo the wrong that's done to the one who was injured? Furthermore, how is forgiveness appropriate for those who do not acknowledge any sin? How is forgiveness appropriate for those who are unrepentant, who insist on remaining what they are, which is opposed to the righteousness of God and opposed to his rulership over their lives? How does that accomplish anything? And if they continue eternally to be unrepentant, their continued existence and presence in God's kingdom would surely destroy that very kingdom by perpetuating unrighteousness and rebellion in a kingdom that is defined by the doing of God's will. And for that matter, is it merciful, is it benevolent to allow people to continue for eternity in their delusion that their sinful choices don't really matter? that the universe is really as they see it, all twisted and distorted, out of shape, instead of being in accordance with God's ways. Is that merciful, benevolent? <clears throat> so in terms of the issue of suffering and evil, the doctrine of hell essentially answers one point. Why doesn't God do something about the evil that causes so much pain in the world? Have you ever heard that? Yes. Why doesn't he do something? 
You know, I've seen that even those who don't acknowledge any sin on their part, don't acknowledge their own sin, or don't think that it's any big deal, they will generally admit that there are some things in the world that are so evil that they must be stopped. And most would also agree that those who commit such atrocities should be punished for their crimes. According to the Bible, hell was created as a means for punishing angels who sinned, The Bible also insists that those who refuse to acknowledge Christ, who refuse His grace, who will not submit to His Lordship, will be judged and punished by being cast into hell. So God's final judgment, therefore, justly repays those who have committed evil with the punishment that their evil deserves. No one is getting away with anything. No one is getting away with anything. God promises to exact retribution on those who do not repent. And no one will be unfairly judged. No one will be condemned for actions they could not have avoided. And no one will be punished beyond what is right. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Of course he will. Those who refused Christ will not be forced to join him in his kingdom. They'll be allowed, they'll be freed, if you will. Harsh use of the term. They'll be freed to continue to be separated from the presence of God. Because that is the essence of hell. To be separated from the presence of God. And therefore separated from all love, all mercy, all truth, all hope, all joy, all kindness, all goodness. to be shut out from all that is good and true and right, to exist where there is no love, no peace, no joy. Back to you somehow, Greg. This. Shift over here. the essence of hell. To be consumed by lust that can never be satisfied and tormented by your own undiminished rage and self-hatred, filled with anxiety and fear and insane thoughts, knowing that you are there by your own choice. Let's look, at, let's look at some conclusions then for part six. Number one, the inability of this present world to provide ultimate rewards and ultimate benefits for righteousness or adequate justice for wickedness all points to the existence of, a, of another world, the next world, in which those can be remedied. Secondly, just as good and evil can only be rightly assessed in the light of eternity, our sufferings and pains can only be rightly understood in relation to eternity. We have to hold on to that. Number three, the pain and sufferings of this life are neither ultimate, they're not final. We are promised that heaven will swallow up the hurts of this life and replace them with joy. If you've ever lost a loved one, a family member, you're holding on to that truth that those in Christ, we have the promise of resurrection. Fourthly, for all those who belong to Christ, all of the suffering and the pain of this life is going to be forever erased. It'll be like a bad dream that you've just woken up from, and it's swallowed up in the overwhelming reality of the presence of God with whom there is no sorrow. One of those things, you remember that you had this dream, but you can't quite remember what it was. Fifth, the suffering and pain in this life that are due to the sins of people or angels, they will not go unpunished. God will mete out retribution against those who have injured others to vindicate his own righteousness and to demonstrate both the evil, sinful actions that caused harm to people whom he loves and the value of those who are wronged. 